get a sense of who's in the room. How many of you are faculty members, please? Just, okay. How many of you are staff members and students? Very good. Yeah. Is there anybody not affiliated with the university in any way, but are here because it's a warm place in a storm? <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> we, are, we are from Vermont, uh, so we have a similar weather, although the weather that we have in Vermont is not nearly as cold as the weather you have. I've been told that you've had sub-zero temperatures. I don't believe we have had a sub-zero temperature day. In December, we had a three-foot snowfall, uh, but we have not had snow since. So this is wonderful. It reminds us of home. Uh, this is my uh, co-presenter, uh, Dr. Demetra Lachey Bradley, and I am uh, Dr. Robert J. Nash. Now somebody is presenting us. protocol. Um, thank you all very much for uh, turning out today, and we're hoping that discussing hot topics will be the right thing for a cold, snowy day. Uh, my name is Susan Carlson. I'm here representing the Provost Office, and I welcome you on behalf of that office and the Committee for the Iowa State Difficult Dialogues Program. About a year ago, the university committed to establishing a Difficult Dialogues Program, and the goal is to create a culture of dialogue on campus where people differing in perspectives, opinions, beliefs, and worldviews can interact productively, especially in the classroom. A committee of faculty, staff, and students has been working very hard for almost a year to get this program up and running. And I'd just like to read quickly their names. They're almost all here, and, and many of you will know some of them. Corley Brook, Katie Jaco, Lisa Larson, Aiden Mann, Steve Michelson, Megan Murphy, Elaine Newell, Santos Nunez Galicia, Kevin Saunders, and Eunice Zhao. But a special thanks to Tynez Jones. Tynez, raise your hand back here at the back, who has <laughs> who is our program coordinator for the program and has put together today's event um, and helped us bring our our guests here. So I'd like to turn uh, the microphone over to one of my colleagues on the committee, uh, Santos uh, Gal uh, Nunez Galicia, um, who's the Director of Multicultural Student Affairs. Thank you, Dr. Carlson. <laughs> Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Is everybody warm enough? A little bit, okay. Well, uh, I would uh, like to welcome everyone to our event today. And before I introduce our speakers, just a quick moment. Uh, those of us who teach, you know, we always like to have this reminder for our students. If you'd like to take a moment and check your cell phones and make sure that they're on vibrate, I think that would be a, a good thing to do for our speakers today. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Uh, Dr. Robert Nash has been a professor in the College of Education and Social Services at the University of Mer Vermont, Burlington, for 41 years. He specializes in philosophy of education, applied ethics, higher education and religion, spirituality, and education. He holds graduate degrees in English, theology, religious studies, applied ethics and liberal studies, and educational philosophy. He holds faculty appointments in teacher education, higher education administration, and interdisciplinary studies in education. He administers the interdisciplinary master's program, and he teaches applied ethics, religion, higher education, and philosophy of education courses, as well as scholarly personal narrative writing seminars, which is a genre of writing that he created. He also, uh, has su supervised over a hundred theses and dissertations and has published more than a hundred articles in many of the leading journals in education at all levels. He has done a variety of consultancies throughout the country for a number of human service organizations, public schools, and colleges and universities. He is a frequent featured speaker at the national level and in 2003 he was named the official university scholar in the social sciences and the humanities at the University of Vermont. Only the second faculty member in the history of the College of Education and Social Services to be so honored. In 2009, he received the Joseph Anthony Abruscato Award 
for Excellence in Research and Scholarship at the University of Vermont, Dr. Nash. Our other speaker is Dr. Demetra Lachey Bradley. She is a scholar and practitioner at the University of Vermont. She sh serves as an instructor in the College of Education and Social Services and holds a dual appointment in the Division of Enrollment Management and the Division of Student and Campus Life. Her scholarly personal narrative dissertation earned her the CESS Outstanding Academics and Service Award. Dr. Bradley is the second author of the national bestseller, How to Talk About Hot Topics on Campus from Polarization to Moral Conversation, published in 2008. She has also co-authored book chapters in Searching for Spirituality in Higher Education and the American University in a Post-Secular Age, Religion and the Academy. It is my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Please give them a round of applause. So we are going to work with this one microphone as best we can, and we may switch off to the, this microphone and the lapel mic. So once again, Robert and I are very pleased to be here at ISU and for the wonderful turnout considering the weather. We have done this type of workshop in as long as half a day and as short as 45 minutes. So we have 50 minutes here with you today. <laughs> so we are going to give you a, you know, a teaser, a tidbit, and hope that as the rest of the day goes on and as the difficult dialogues, um, conversations continue in this community that you engage in them. And we also want to give time for our live case study in a little bit. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Robert for our first part of the presentation while I'm on the PowerPoint. Um, again, we're going to be very brief. We're trying to squeeze into maybe 20 minutes uh, what we've done in hours before. Um, this was um, our first co-authoring book project. And um, Demetra and I were interested in writing a book because we've done a, a lot of co-teaching. And because we uh, co-teach courses that are very, very provocative, very controversial. I'm the official applied ethicist at my university. I also teach courses in religion and spirituality. Um, I've written widely on character education, moral education. So all the, all the uh, topics that we're not supposed to talk about in public, I teach. And uh, I struggled. I struggle to find a way to talk about these topics without hurting one another in the classroom, without killing one another, uh, and to try to get as many different points of view um, expressed as possible. And um, uh, Demetra was um, wonderful enough to co-teach several of these types of courses with me, and we decided to uh, write a book on uh, uh, how to talk about hot topics on campus from moral conversation. Um, and so this is really what we're here to talk about. And something about our book that we believe makes it special is that, as Robert expressed, his primary experiences on the university campus are inside of the classroom as a faculty member. My primary experiences mm -hmm. are outside of the classroom as an administrator in a variety of student affairs or student campus life programs, as well as in the office of the president and the provost. So when we approach this writing and when we approach moral conversation, we see it not only as a tool by which we can hopefully teach our students, but it's also a tool that we as faculty member colleagues, as staff and administrator colleagues, can hopefully use as well as we delve into difficult dialogues. So we, we decided to do today is speak majorly about three moral conversation virtues. And that first moral conversation virtue is humility. And the best way that we have, I think, in a nutshell, um, expressed what we say about humility in moral conversation is finding the truth in what we oppose and the error in what we espouse. And what, that, what we explain that to be with our students and oftentimes our colleagues is not listening only to respond, but listening to understand, to stand under, to not necessarily agree. Robert may have an opinion about something and I have another opinion. I'm listening to Robert so I can understand Robert 
And maybe I will find the truth in what I oppose, which may be Robert's view and vice versa. But in order to do that, there has to be a listening that comes into perspective. And this is something that is, is difficult for our students, but it's also difficult for us as well as colleagues in the campus community outside of our students. And so that is our first, what I would say, virtue around moral conversation is humility. I'm not going to stand over you to get my point across. I'm going to stand with you and hopefully listen to understand and ask questions of you and hopefully you'll ask questions of me to better understand each other's point of view. Uh, we call this moral conversation not because we're arrogant and think this is the only way to do it and it's the most moral. Uh, we like the word moral because um, its Latin and Greek roots mean standard or pattern of behavior. Um, it also means treating each individual in the conversation with dignity, with respect, with worthiness. And no matter how outrageous we think the message or the belief of the other is, there still has to be an assumption that there's some dignity, some worthwhile value in that human being. And what we're trying to do is find ways to bridge the chasm at times of difference between us and the other, and between the other and us. Um, finding the truth in what we oppose, it very well may be that there's a tiny one hundred thousandth of an inch of truth in what the other person has said. If we're bright enough, and if we're willing enough, we may be able to find that truth. And uh, hopefully that'll generate outward so that the person, the other, will find a little bit of truth in what we're saying. What we're trying to avoid is having people, whether it's one on many, one on one, shouting their truths at others, drowning out the truths of others, going into contestation rather than conversation. Contestation is the rule of the academy. We can test one another. And uh, the winner is the last person left standing in the boxing ring, even though that winner may be very bloodied. Um, we think more of a Vermont analogy called the barn raising. All of us are together to raise the barn together. And to the extent that we can do our jobs well, we have a barn up for people who may not be able to afford to put a barn up on their own. So think of moral conversation as a communal barn raising venture rather than a boxing match uh, with the last person left standing the winner. <coughs> um, I'll, I'll just say something about this then. I'd like to have you uh, do the same, Vinitra. Um, uh, we, we like to play with words. I evoke, invoke, and provoke. Um, what I have found in 42 years of teaching in higher education as a classroom teacher um, is that the extent to which evoke, I can call forth from others, vocare, voc to call forth, to call out of others, is the extent to which I'm going to be able to make some kind of a connection with my students in the classroom. I am saying to them, what you have to say has value. It may not be what I say or what you say or what you say, but I want to hear your voice. Evocation or to evoke is to call forth another human being's voice. And who among us doesn't want to have our voices being heard? Um, provoke, unfortunately, is what we do all so well in higher education and in a number of other venues as well. Uh, to provoke is to speak for. It's to, sometimes it can be irritating. Sometimes it can be enraging. The idea is to anger somebody or get that person's attention in a very, very aggressive way in order to produce an outcome that isn't always educational. Sometimes provocation can be fun. Sometimes it can even result in some kind of an instruction. But I don't know about you, but when somebody tries to deliberately provoke me, I'm provoking back, even though I know that's not going to get much going on be between us. I respond much better to people who call my voice from me rather than angering me. And then invoke is something that we always do. To invoke is to uh, call on the expertise of others. And this is where scholarship and research uh, comes into the teaching learning venture. If I have something to share with you, say my very strong belief in sociobiology or the First Amendment, um, I'm a First Amendment civil libertarian, 
if I have something very strong that I believe about that, uh, one of the things that I'd like to do is share with you the names of others who believe in that as well and maybe get their take on it. Uh, so for me, uh, the fullest kind of moral conversation in the classroom is one where I evoke and invoke and maybe do just a little provoking when things are quiet and people are texting under their tables. <laughs> Which I'm sure never happens here at ISU. <laughs> Another aspect of respect is to the willingness to look again. The willingness to look again at the person's comment or your, even your own opinion. And in doing so, once again, as we talked about this morning, it's around asking questions asking the clarifying question and being willing to hear the answer, whatever that answer may be. We also look at respect in terms of do no harm. Is the comment, is the question out to harm another intentionally? We all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. But is the question there to harm intentionally? Is it to maim intentionally? Is it to perform what we like to call in our book, conversation stoppers, where you know the conversation is not going to go anywhere after someone says whatever that is. Now, all of us are in some level of relationship, be it with colleagues, families, friends, and we all know what that person in our lives could particularly say to make us shut down. And believe it or not, they know too. That might be why they say it sometimes. <laughs> But they know what it is to, to shut us down, and we know what it is and how to shut other individuals down. And what we ask in moral conversation is that both parties, whether it's two, three, eight, twelve, disengage in the conversation stoppers, but engage in what we call the conversation starters, which are the questions. What did you mean by that? How did you arrive at that opinion? Tell me a little bit more about your perspective on this certain topic or this certain situation. So for us, the large part about respect, respiture, to look again, the willingness to look again. Just, uh, just very quickly, uh, to respect doesn't mean you're going to agree with everything. Uh, who wants a bunch of people who agree with everything? Um, I want to be intellectually stimulated. I want to be emotionally stimulated. But if I know you are respectful, respiture, I know that you are going to just re-examine one belief that you have, just a little bit. You are going to look again at the things you take for granted and um, compare them to the things that I take for granted. And you've all got taken for granted. Every single one of you has a whole kit bag of taken for granted. And I would also say that most of you here, probably all of you here, uh, if you fit the uh, profile of humanity, uh, you have your non-negotiable beliefs as well. There are you, there you will not go down beyond a certain level. And what I find exciting as a teacher to be able to get all of you with your non-negotiables and philosophers, which is what I am, know how to get at your non-negotiables very, very quickly, to be able to have all of you have a conversation uh, where you're not trying to harm one another but to help one another across those non-negotiables. I'd like to know what your non-negotiables are, and I hope that you would like to know what mine are as well. <coughs> uh, generosity is a very, very important quality in moral conversation. Um, many classrooms that I've been involved with, um, all of which I've taught, uh, generosity has not been very obvious. Um, I don't know what there is about us academicians, but we don't tend to be very generous toward one another. Come to our conferences watch us deliver papers, come to our sessions, see how we uh, critique one another, how it's important for us to, uh, be, uh, 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 to be winners um, and not losers. And yet, that's not the way that I and faculty and my colleagues at the University of Vermont communicate with one another outside the university. We can kick back over coffee, um, we can talk, we can watch ball games together, um, we're just, we're different animals, but somehow when we get in that highly contestative atmosphere called the, uh, the American University, we change. And there's a lot of good that comes from that uh, way of living together, uh, but there's also a lot of alienation. 
Um, and so we believe in being generous and uh, in moral conversation if no matter how, um, uh, how disgraceful you think a comment is, how disrespectful it is, how off the mark it is, and I, an indication of generosity is at some level the person who has said that or the person who believes that with all of his heart and soul that goes against what I believe with all of my heart and soul is a potential ally. Maybe somewhere along the way, he and I, she and I, we can meet across the chasm of our differences. And that means exercising a little generosity. I want to be a generous human being. I want to be a generous teacher. As a matter of fact, everything that we're saying has uh, applications for intimate relationships. I don't know whether any of you are involved in relationships. <laughs> a couple of chuckles, but I've been with my partner for 53 years, and uh, we're trying to practice moral conversation every day. We're still learning how to do it. What works for me in the classroom, believe it or not, works for me with my partner. Sometimes better on some days and sometimes not so good on some days, but it's really just being generous. Oh, can be tough tom sometimes. Mm -hmm. We were recently at a at a presentation in Indiana where one of the students, it was an all male college, and he literally asked, "So is this okay, well, if is this something that I can use in my personal relationships?" And we said, "Sure, why not?" He said, "Because well, I'm trying to break up with somebody, so how do I? <laughs> 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 so how do I? Um, how would I apply?" So he was sitting at my table, and we had a pretty good, you know, like 10 to 15 minute conversation on the tools of moral conversation and breaking up. So, and he brought it up. We didn't, Robert hadn't made that comment. So I thought that it was interesting that, that this student was able to see the overlap between what, what could occur for us inside of our classrooms and outside of our classrooms. Before we go on, another piece around generosity. It, gentle, go, being gentle with individuals and critical of ideas. Moral conversation is not about agreeing and yes, yes, that's fine, that's fine with someone's idea. This is the academy, this is education. We can disagree with one, of one another's ideas, that's how we learn and or that's how we strengthen our own opinions. But disagreeing or being critical of a person's ideas is very different than being critical of the person. So part of moral conversation around, around generosity is gentle with the person, critical on ideas. And I know, I know this doesn't happen here, but at UVM, the way in which we're the most ungenerous with one another is the gossip. I know that doesn't happen here. Yeah, everyone's like, yeah, okay. But at UVM, the gossip, that's being critical of the person. Everyone plays nice inside the meeting, but then in the parking lot, over instant messenger, the Facebook, whatever you want to use. It's the gossip, and it's, you know, well, they didn't do this, and they didn't do that. The idea has long been gone, but it's the person that begins to be attacked. And what we espouse with moral conversation is be gentle with the individual, be gentle with the person, and be critical with the ideas. And I was just thinking uh, very quickly that the opposite of generosity is selfishness. And I was thinking that the way that uh, I'm rewarded as a faculty member is to be selfish, is to work alone, do my, ri do my writing alone, uh, do my teaching with the door closed. And uh, it's all about me. It's all about me. And I found that the best way to work with human beings is not to make it all about me, but to make it all about us, generosity. And I know that the students here can very, very quickly identify faculty members who are generous as opposed to faculty members who are selfish. And I would predict, I have no empirical evidence for this other than a hunch, I would predict that the teachers that we remember long after we're, we're gone from the university are the teachers who were generous with us, who spent time with us, who were as interested in us as they were interested in themselves. And that, again, is another characteristic of what it is to be generous in moral conversation. It sends the message, what you have to say is important to me. I want to hear it. I may not agree with it. I may have some problems with it, but I want to hear it and I want to understand it because it's you who is delivering the message. 
So at this point in time, we're going to have some ISU community members, students, and administrators do a live case study. We, all, we, we enjoy case studies with this work because it gives us something to, some meat to hold on to and not just the abstract ideas. But this is the first time we've ever seen one live. So we are very pleased and after they perform the case study, we'll be fielding questions as well as expressing what we would do in these type of situations with moral conversation. Um, so we're going to briefly take you through a case study um, that focuses on a hot topic that's been going around um, as of recent to give us some ideas of what do some of these situations in our classrooms look like um, so that we can kind of start a discussion of, of some ideas of how is it that we can sort of handle um, these controversial issues. Um, and so we will begin with a scenario that happens in a speech class where an announcement has been made by the instructor regarding the help effort for Haiti. Scene. <laughs> During times of crisis, like Hurricane Katrina, the tsunami, and now the earthquake in Haiti, people have in some ways made an effort to help th those people who are affected. Many university programs are pl planning a support effort for Haiti. So before the lecture, I just wanted to highlight one in particular. If you're interested in making donations to the Haiti cause, the MSA office located in student services or student support services is going to be taking donations of canned foods, clothes, new or used, blankets, and or monetary donations. So Dr. Randall, that seems like a good idea and whatever, um, but how do we know that these people are gonna receive the, the supplies with all the violence and corruption going on in Haiti right now? Even one of our own ISU alumni suggested we should be apprehensive about what money we send and spend. Plus, he said, those people should take responsibility for their own disaster, and I agree with that. I mean, will our support even help, considering that Haiti was poverty-stricken before the earthquake because of that pact they made with the devil? <laughs> yeah, I've heard of that pact. During people rose up and killed a mass number of white men, women, and children, and they've been living in poverty ever since. This is a very typical in almost all of black nations. Black rule equals third world hobble. Over the past three weeks, we've been discussing the categorization of flame, uh, claims in preparation for our next speech presentation. There are many claims made here today. However, we know that a claim cannot be uh, cannot be made unless it is supported. Would you say the Haiti evil pact claim is fact, value, or true claim? Fact. Fact. Lisa, you're from Haiti, right? What do you have, what do you think about these claims? Before we say what we may do in this situation, we'd like to hear from a, a couple of the audience members, what, how, how would you, in whatever your role is on campus, be it faculty or staff administrator, how would you respond if this situation occurred in, in your classroom, group, res hall, et cetera? This is not our case, by the way. This is their case. Don't be shy. I have a concern addressing the student at the very end and putting them on the spot saying, you represent this group, what do you think, okay? And um, I think that's always a, a challenge in class. I mean, to let people express but not to call on somebody to represent that whole group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, in moral conversation, we seem to get the best results when we, see, when we deal with people as individuals, not as members of groups. And moreover, when we ask people to express their ideas, their beliefs, their opinions as individuals and not members of a group. Don't speak for a group, speak for yourself. 
Uh, later on, we may be able to generalize if we can get enough consensus around it, but in a classroom uh, or in a club meeting or some, something that happens in an organizational meeting, it's important for individuals to feel that they are individuals. That doesn't mean that they don't have identities, they do. They're, we're all multiple identities. Uh, but to ask somebody on the spot the way this person was, what do you think about what happened, makes her the spokesperson for all of Haiti and all of the mythology that surrounds it. And I think your point is a good one. Thank you. So what else came up for, for individuals in witnessing this case study? Yes. I think when you come out and make an announcement like that, it's almost a form of advocacy and it automatically whether they should give to the cause or not. That may be a little bit of provoking the conversation, but I think it, you know, a certain amount of humility might set that up a little bit. Um, for instance, uh, you could show, uh, I just did this in my class. I mean, basically you show earthquakes, what earthquakes do, you show the destruction, and then you can make a statement saying something to the effect that there are outlets for you to show your um, uh, support of the people, and if any of you are interested, uh, there are plenty of outlets for that, or you can talk to me. But I, I feel a little bit, I'm a little bit cautious about throwing that stuff right out in front. I think it puts people on the defensive right away, uh, and it may start a conversation, but I also think that it's a, bit, it's a form of advocacy that may not be needed. And what we would, thank you very much, and what, what we would, what we talk about with when to introduce, so to speak, moral conversation is m knowing how to approach it. Uh, from an administrator's standpoint, for me, it's time, place, and manner. So knowing how to approach it, when to approach it, and what may happen upon, upon the approach. And so as a faculty member or staff member, et cetera, However you choose to, if you choose to outright say, you know, just if you want to support the, what's going on in Haiti, please, you know, please do so or ask me after class or whatnot. You may invite a variety of conversation, but then what happens after? So almost having what we talked about at lunchtime, the go-to shot of if, if a conversation could arise or a comment could arise, what am I going to do if I'm going to have class time to discuss this or, or hear a variety of perspectives? But I do like what you said and what we would, what I would call that from an administrative standpoint is time, place, and manner. And what we would call that from moral conversation is knowing when to, when and how to introduce based on your classroom and your, your climate. Um, again, very briefly, as a faculty member, um, let's say in one of my religion classes I was trying to teach the, uh, uh, the quality of compassion. Uh, what I might do, and I'd I've been doing this more and more as I get older as a teacher, is sharing what moves me in my life, what gives my life meaning. And I might bring in an article from a newspaper or recount something that I saw in a television shot about the terrible devastation and suffering uh, in Haiti. And uh, then I might relate it to the lesson at hand. It would not be out of context, it would be in context. And then I might open it, I'm asking myself this question all the time as an educator, as a teacher. What is the learning potential in my doing this? Is this for me? Is this for them? Is this for both of us? And uh, so I might ask a question like, um, as I read this story to you, as I recounted what I saw on television that really gripped me so much, what were some of your responses to it? Uh, I don't think the classroom is a place to uh, start making contributions, um, uh, getting money, having people give to the cause. I think there are lots of other places you can do that. But the classroom for me, the, in moral conversation, the central question is, how can I make this a teachable moment? How can I enable my students to learn something more about themselves and about others in the world that they may not have known before they walked into my class that day? I really liked very much what you said. Thank you. Did you want to follow up? No, I, no, I agree. And I, but I also, you know, if I put it in the context of an earthquake, then you automatically kind of send a message to the fact of the devil um, side of that story. And um, I didn't get anybody in class come back with that, actually. So that was interesting. But no, I agree. I agree. And 
think it's just all the, it's, it's what you want at the end. And if you want a discussion on it, that's great. But time, place, and manner, yeah, in my class, it's, you know, it wasn't a, a good spot to do that. So disciplined with me. Um, <clears throat> I would like to know, uh, I would ask a question like, uh, and this was um, uh, Pat Robertson who said the pact with the devil. Um, I would like to get a response from my class, something like this, and it would be in my religion spirituality class. Why do you think Pat Robertson, who has several degrees, uh, who is um, a worldwide leader in the Christian church, why do you suppose Pat Robertson would say something like that? Is there any truth in that for Pat Robertson? What do you think Pat Robertson's truth is? So that we could talk about that. I'm not going to damn that guy. I don't even know him. But I know he, he, he can't be evil incarnate. Maybe even if somebody believe he is, that's all the more reason for me to open up the question. Why do you think this man is evil incarnate? Let's talk about it a little bit. Like I said, we, we, we do this in half a day, in three hours, but, <laughs> but when we, we have, have 50 minutes, yeah. <laughs> we gotta, we got to stay on track. But um, something else, I, I, what, I, what I hope, um, and I'd like to continue to open it up to the larger community, is really the question of your institution and, you know, continuing to use this case study around humility, respect, and generosity, what else came up? In the case study, did anything that was said or the, the exchange between the faculty member and the students, did something cause anyone to cringe outside of putting the, uh, so it's putting the student from Haiti on the spot, so to speak? What, did anything else cause anyone to cringe? I know you mentioned the pack with the devil. Please. Yes. Well, the, the generalization that somehow they should um, pay for Accept responsibility for um, I don't know, poor infrastructure or whatever the whatever they were thinking, and then you know just seconds later someone came back and said something about poverty, and I'm thinking, well, if they don't have the capabilities, how are they going to <coughs> fix it themselves? But um, I don't know. Yeah, it, it it seemed impersonal. Um, and maybe And so if, if that, are you a faculty member? No. Oh, okay, well, let's just pretend. Are you student, student club organization, do you interact with students in any way? Okay, well, whatever those interactions are. <laughs> if, that was, if, that was, um, if that was the conversation that went on in a, perhaps a student group or a group of students that you come into contact with, would, how, would, how do you think you have responded? Would it have taken you aback in a no response way? Or how do you think you may have invoked from those students? Evoked. I would probably just not say anything, but maybe the right thing to do would be ask for examples. So how do you propose that they you know, would be able to um, come back to them? Yeah, that's a, that, that, that is the, I mean, we, that is one of the, I should say, right things to do. It's around asking the questions. And that's an, that's an excellent go-to shot, which is because what I, and I, I'll, I'll definitely get to you, what I noticed in your response of what made you kind of cringe was the situation around they should be responsible for their own infrastructure. And then two seconds later, someone saying, but you know, this is a poor, impoverished nation. And what I heard you say was, well, some things go hand in hand. If they don't have the resources, how could they be responsible? So that may be part of the, the questioning and the probing deeper with that group of students, which sounds like you know something that you obviously know about in terms of how poverty, poverty-stricken nations and the infrastructure or lack thereof work. So that would be an ideal example of how to continue a conversation with those students. So thank you. One of the things that made me cringe was the instructor asked, is this a fact or an opinion? And the student said, fact, but it clearly isn't. <laughs> and there's no follow-up. We, we actually, uh, there was a, we talked about this in the early morning session around beliefs, 
learnings and false ideas and how as as educators in regard whatever sense of the word that it's our responsibility to educate around the false ideas so that is another piece around well act you know actually or um, well, let's talk about this a little further. What makes you believe that this is a fact? And let's, you know, let's, let's get into that type of conversation. Okay. <laughs> you evoked for me the philosopher's response. That's the one thing that really got to me. Um, and that's why I asked uh, f for the, uh, to, to look at the case up close. Fact, value, or truth claim. What a wonderful opportunity for learning the distinctions between fact, value, opinion, truth claim, what is a fact? What represents a fact for you may not represent a fact for her. If you're, if you're studying literature, fact is something different from if you're studying evolution, whether you're a biologist, a chemist, a philosopher, if you will. That's a teachable moment. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. And that's all. Yes. <coughs> a legacy that I got as a graduate student was from, uh, from a professor who got it from his Harvard professor, and it was uh, some of what you've been saying was assertion is not proof. Assertion is not proof. And I wrote it on many student papers. <laughs> uh, but I think in a conversation as well as in papers, uh, and what we heard here, here was an assertion about blacks. Here was a stereotype of a black uh, nation or whatever. We'll do this. So again, I, uh, again, maybe in a gentle way, you can kind of bring that up. Uh, you know, from what I hear, and, and I, you're using some other language to claim, but that's an assertion. You know, what's the truth? Or what? What? Uh, how do you? How do you? How do you document that? And those are those are wonderful follow-up questions where you're you're bringing you're you're giving the person an opportunity to further expand on this opinion. And then you're also role modeling, whether it be in the classroom or outside of the classroom, how to ask questions of opinions that students may not agree with. Because it, sometimes our students as well as ourselves get stuck. I don't really agree with that, but how can I say it in such a way where I'm not being too confrontational because I actually want to hear what this person has to say. So that's a, that's a wonderful way to role model that. And I would just like to add again, you got me as a philosopher. <coughs> that um, another uh, commonality that we all have is that uh, we make assertions. We're assertion-making creatures. And even the assertion that assertion is not fact is an assertion. And I would like to talk with you about what makes your assertion more assertional than my <laughs> assertion. <laughs> and it, um, I'm, it sounds like a word game, and it is to some extent. But what it does for students, it lets them know that we're as prone uh, to making statements or assertions without the kind of backup we assume they have as they are. We're all in this together trying to make sense of a world that can at times can be senseless. What is the sense of what happened in Haiti? I'd like to talk with students about that. I'd like to talk to believers, religious believers about that. I'd like to talk to atheists about that. This is the kind of stuff I teach. I'd like to look at the ethics of what's going on around all of that. And certainly a term we all take for granted like assertion and fact and value and um, subjective opinion or whatever, all of that is important meat for teaching. Were there any other comments from the audience? I'm going to keep looking at the clock. Yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, I have a question. It's not related to the case study, so if that's okay if I can ask that. Mm -hmm. Of course. Of course. So typically, if in a conversation between students, faculty, faculty colleagues, etc., conflict typically arises when somebody is not following this. Right? Whether we we work with our colleagues or students throughout the course of time, everybody has personalities. So how do you how do you address that? Because some people might repeatedly be trying to, you know, not move the conversation <laughs> forward. For example, so how do you address that in the context of you know treating being critical of ideas? Rather We, we talked about this last night in terms of, well, when do you just, to use Robert's term, you know, when do you exile somebody? Is there a point when you just say, okay, y you know, you got to go? You're out of here. Um, <laughs> You're a <and> false man. 
Uh, Robert said that. I, I didn't say that. Robert said that. <laughs> but in, in all seriousness, there, I, I always think about the, the whole like Kenny Rogers thing. You got to know when to hold them, when to fold them, when to walk away, when to run. And, that, and part of that is knowing when to continue to engage with someone. And this is something that we often teach our students, but we make the reminders ourselves is when to continue to engage. And what we say is on the onset, give everyone a benefit of a doubt. On the onset, believe, attribute the best motives. But at some point in time, your own intuition as a person, um, your own intuition as a scholar, may cause you to say, okay, I, I, I really do see where this is going. We're gonna argue for arguing's sake, and this is no longer becoming a beneficial conversation for either, e either party. Now with our students, at Robert and I, we often push our students to bring the conversation back to mutual learning and mutual accountability, that I'm learning and I'm being accountable for my own learning Let's, let's have a, let's, for you to do the same as student to student. And we can facilitate that because we have a level of a power dynamic in our, inside of our classroom. But colleague to colleague, part of it is instinctual, where you know at some point in time, okay, this isn't, this isn't going as, as hopeful, this isn't going towards mutual learning, and I'll need to conclude the conversation. It doesn't mean, however, that you need to conclude it disrespectfully or you know, conclude it in a, in a way that leaves you thinking or feeling that you weren't your best self. But it does mean that you can say, I'm going to conclude this conversation right now. And w w the reason we say tools instead of rules or some other language when it comes to moral conversation is some tools work for a variety of jobs. And some tools are just for one specific job at hand and you can't do anything else with that tool. And so we have a variety of those in moral conversation. We have some tools where they work inside the classroom, outside the classroom, our personal private relationships as well as our public collegial ones. And then there's some of our tools that only work when they've been built upon in a 15 week uh, course if you teach semesters or 10 weeks if you teach quarters. So that's part of it is that this part of the tools some you can use all the time, some you can only use for a particular job at hand. Thank you for that question, though. Uh, maybe this will be the last comment. Uh, please understand that something will go wrong before it goes right in moral conversation. There are always bombs. And one of the bombs that gets to me is somebody will say, well, let me de be a devil's advocate, Robert. <laughs> and I always say, you know, in my experience, the devil has more advocates than he can deal with. What are you advocating? I want to hear what you have to advocate. Uh, and maybe sometime when you have a little time, think about all the bombs that can be dropped, either um, intentionally or unintentionally. This is never going to be smooth. Never, ever going to be smooth. It takes practice. It's like the practice of law and the practice of medicine. It's the practice of moral conversation. The more you do it, the closer you'll get to where you want to be. And, and my last comment before I turn the mic over is, is potentially for all of us to encourage our students, but also encourage ourselves to have the go-to shot. When, when a conversation arises that you don't expect is going to arise, to have that go-to shot. Because many of us have been in, in, you're like, this is not on my classroom agenda. This is not what we're supposed to be talking about right now. Oh, but it needs to be talked about. So what can my go-to shot be? To buy me a little time, to come back to it, what can my go-to sh go shot be? And if we think about those things before they actually happen, we can pull it out of our back pocket when those hot topics do arise. Before I turn it over, thank you very much for thank attending you. this afternoon.